loud. Uh, Catherine, it is my great pleasure to welcome Catherine Stafford this evening, and Catherine's going to give a talk in honour of this sad anniversary of Holocaust Memorial Day. Catherine. The suicide of German Jews under the Nazis. In the months after the Nazis seized power in January 1933, Jews suffered frequent and random attacks at the hands of the SA stormtroopers. Many committed suicide as a result of this violence. Matt Reiner, a journalist forced to retire in 1933 as he was Jewish and not permitted to belong to uh, a newspaper or anything to do with the civil service, noted in his diary on the 24th of April that on a recent visit to a Jewish cemetery in Berlin, he had seen many new double graves. These were the graves of couples who had committed suicide together. Before 1933, Jews had by choice not appeared as a separate political body in German society. But with Hitler's rise to power, the rapid issuing of anti-Jewish laws together with propaganda and direct violent action by Nazi enforcers, it was clear that there had to be a united Jewish voice to attempt to represent Germany's Jews to the state to influence the Nazi regime, which of course we know with hindsight was totally impossible, and to aid the Jewish community. Thus, in September, Jewish organizations came together to form a major confederation, the central organization of German Jews. This was the corporate response to the Nazi regime's clear intention to defame and ostracize Jews, to destroy or confiscate their businesses, and to lower their social and legal standing, starting with the April 1st boycott of Jewish businesses. For the next two years, German Jews faced disenfranchisement, humiliation and violence, but not as official state-sponsored abuse. But on the 15th of September, 1935, the Nuremberg laws turned random and orchestrated acts of terror into a legal system and formally declared the Jews to not be German citizens and therefore without protection of the law. And they also established racial segregation, mixed marriage was forbidden. Even so, many Jews sought to console themselves that things could improve, that this too shall pass, that the tide could change after all, persecution had been their story for centuries. This cautious optimism would vanish on the night of the 9th to the 10th of November 1938 with the state organized pogrom known as Kristallnacht, during which 267 synagogues were burnt, destroyed, 7,000 businesses, Jewish businesses damaged or destroyed, 30,000 Jewish men arrested and incarcerated in concentration camps, such as Dachau and Sachsenhausen, and an estimated 638 deaths. One thing was made clear on that night, integrationist aspirations were dead. It was never going to be possible to be Jewish and German in Nazi Germany. So then, how did individual German Jewish men and women cope with this remorseless, if gradual, dehumanization process, this social death, which was the essential precursor to ultimate deportation and murder, and which they suffered every day at the hands of the German racial community, the man in the street, their neighbors, the greengrocer, their children's teachers, their friends. We were so German. We were so assimilated. 
We were so middle class. Thus, in their memoirs, surviving Jews try to explain both to themselves as well as posterity what their life was like before Nazi savagery ripped them from German society and swept them away. Underlying all responses of these highly acculturated Jews was the white noise of anti-Semitism, that vague sense of unease about Jews on the part of Germans and about Germans on the part of Jews. One woman, Rachel Strauss, who had worked closely with Aryan women during the Weimar Republic, commented on the distance between the groups, that despite acceptance in everyday life, sitting on the same benches at school and university, sharing public transport and, uh, and sharing an office at work, attending sporting and cultural events. Despite all of this, she realized that we lived among each other and were complete strangers. We were separated by a wall of glass. At home in Germany for many generations, nevertheless, Jews weren't uncomprehending of the fact that their <laughs> legal status as citizens and the opening of higher education and the professions, all of which dated from the 19, uh, 1871 unification of Germany, didn't mean complete acceptance. But they thought they understood the nuances of their own German culture when they looked around them at other countries. To the east, they saw the pogroms of Russia and Poland. By the 1930s, one in every five Jews in Germany was an Eastern European refugee. To the west, the ultimate secular haven of Jewry since Napoleon's time, France, proved that liberté, égalité, and fraternité was an illusion if you were a Jew, as Dreyfus discovered. This sense of comparative safety in the most civilized European nation made an effective barrier to comprehension, the sheer inconceivability of genocide. This difficulty in processing in interpreting events on the ground, the fact that they were absolutely rejected, was reinforced by the fact that German Jews had, since their enfranchisement, contributed disproportionately to German cultural life and society at large. And also, uh, to a great degree, as a result of mixed marriage. When the Nazis came to power, there were approximately 35,000 couples living a mixed marriage. The city of Hamburg had at that time a whopping 57% of all Jewish weddings were to non-Jews. Most importantly, the offspring of these unions, known as Mischlinger, were mostly baptized and brought up as Christians. What, me, Jewish? Don't be ridiculous. Many, to their dismay, shared the fate of those fully self-identifying Jews. One pensioner, Dora G., married to a non-Jewish husband, expresses this sense of outrage at being considered Jewish when she clearly didn't think herself so. She gassed herself in her Berlin kitchen rather than face deportation in 1943 and left a distressed note for her husband, detailing her lack of Jewishness. 40 years married to Aryans, first in America to a Protestant, then 34 years in her second marriage. She brought up her children as Aryans, took them to Holy Communion. She didn't marry according to her Jewish faith. None of this saved her. Another suicide, Margaret A., a 58-year-old widow from Berlin, took cyanide the night before her deportation. 
declaring that she was the widow of a lieutenant colonel in the army, and hence German, not Jewish. Holding on to their middle-class values and way of life was a matter of dignity and integrity. Many men emphasize their German identity by dressing in their army uniforms, complete with the medals they had won in the Great War when they killed themselves. It was a resistance against dehumanization. Jews who died by their own hand succeeded in their desire for a death of their own, snatching it from the Nazis. The suicides of deeply acculturated German Jews were not typ typically expressions of anger against the unloved self. They were mostly carefully prepared, often in the presence of, and even with the help of relatives. With time spent in nostalgic conversations and memories of a happy German childhood, turning in their last hours to the consolation of the German classics, of Schiller and Goethe, of Bach and Beethoven. There was no condemnation for them from secularized families, no sense of breaking religious taboos. Two elderly sisters the night before their deportation were given cyanide by their family, who first tried to dissuade them but then assisted, assisted them and remained as the sisters died in their own beds with clean bed linen and fresh flowers on the table. Two young women decided to kill themselves along with their 92 year old mother. Although they felt they could have coped with deportation, their elderly parent couldn't. This is the only act of love we can still perform for her. One grandson sat and listened to his 83 year old grandmother reminisce about her youth. And then he read to her from Schiller before she took a large quantity of sleeping pills and drifted off. German Jews had a high regard for the law which had after all obtained for them their status and civic freedoms within Germany. Most difficult for them was the fact that the law itself as defined by the Nazis had become their persecutor. In the early thirties, one woman put it th thus, the most frightening thing at this moment was being deprived of the protection of the law. Anybody could accuse you of anything and you were lost. An example of this leading to tragedy, in 1933, a German Jewish man was arrested because his neighbor complained of his behavior towards her dog. He was arrested. He killed himself in prison, leaving a note explaining that he could no longer stand the unjust and defenseless life of a Jew in Germany. Martha Lieberman, widow of the famous artist Max Lieberman, committed suicide after receiving her deportation notice in March 1943. By that time, there was a special ward in the Berlin Jewish Hospital dedicated to failed suicides, a clear indicator that Jewish suicide had become an everyday occurrence. The doctors there debated whether or not to treat attempted suicides or to let them die of their wounds, as if they kept their patients alive and they recovered, they would be arrested deported and murdered. The deportations that began in October 1941 saw a rise in the suicide rate of German Jews. Between 1941 and 1943, there were between three and 4,000 Jewish suicides. 
At the beginning of the deportations, the Berlin Gestapo issued written orders a week before the actual deportation. Later on, the Nazis did not tell the Jews in advance of the deportation, as so many had used the interim to kill themselves. Instead, they raided houses and carried off the inhabitants. The determination of the police and the Gestapo to not be cheated of controlling the death of the Jews is borne out by the fact that once deportations had begun, they often inspected the pharmacy of the Berlin Jewish hospital to make sure that no poison had been issued to Jews. As Howard K. Smith, an American journalist, commented on the raids for deportation, it was death one way or the other, and the sensible ones chose it sooner and easier rather than later and harder. Austrian Jews also chose to kill themselves rather than wait to be murdered. Within a month of the Anschluss in March 1938, 7,500 Viennese Jews had committed suicide. And this was out of a pop total Jewish population of Austria of only 188,000. After a Jewish shopkeeper had committed suicide along with his family in Vienna, stormtroopers plastered his shop windows with placards saying, please imitate. The Anschluss with its delivery of the same persecution and violent humiliation of the German Jews that had taken five years was compressed into one day. Everything that had happened to the German Jews, confiscation of property of their bank accounts, being forced to turn over their businesses to Aryans, not being able to go to normal schools, only to Jewish schools, losing their jobs, not being able to use public transportation, not to be able to sit on a park bench to go to the cinema, to go to a cafe, to own a dog or a bicycle. All of these things that had happened gradually were compressed into one day when Germany invaded Austria or took over Austria. And this gave a huge boost to anti-Semitism across the whole of Germany and was a significant step towards the Nazis' long-term aim to purge Germany of every single Jew. One avoidable tragedy was the death of Austrian playwright and historian Egon Friedel. His maid's lover, was in the SA. And having been a soldier of God. One of the one avoidable tragedy was the death of Austrian playwright and historian Egon Friedel. His maid's lover was in the SA, and having seen the soldier arrive at the door of the flat, accompanied by another man in uniform, and thinking they had come for him, Egon jumped out of his bathroom window. The end of the war in 1945 did not put an end to the suffering of those who endured the Holocaust, nor to the suicides of Jewish survivors, whose self-inflicted deaths can be broadly seen as the result of long-term traumatization, those who emerged from the horror. Paul Celan, Romanian-born German language poet of distinction after the war, who committed suicide in 1970, never recovered from the murder of his parents and his own incarceration in work camps. 
Jean Améry, born Hans Meyer, an Austrian essayist who was tortured by the Gestapo, wrote, whoever has succumbed to torture can no longer feel at home in the world. He committed suicide in 1978. Elie Wiesel said of Primo Levi, renowned for his accounts of his experience at Auschwitz. Elie said of Primo Levi, Primo Levi died at Auschwitz 40 years later. Perhaps these suicides and those of many other less well-known survivors that don't even figure in the statistic of six million murdered Jews are amongst the most tragic. Catherine, thank you. I, th I all, all I, that was harrowing. I'm feeling very shook and very deeply moved. Um, anyone, if you have comments or questions you'd like to ask Catherine as part of the recording, um, please do so. Uh, you need to unmute yourself first. Yeah, uh, Catherine, I have two questions for you. Uh, one relates to um, you, you said you mentioned suicide continued after the war, but it wasn't only suicide that continued after the war, was it? They went on killing as many Jews as they could. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Poland was particularly bad in this regard. And uh, people would try to return, Jews would, would try to return home would find someone else occupying their property. And not, not only could they not get into their own house, but they were often, uh, they were often killed, yes. The other question I have for you is on a slightly different um, plane. Do you think that killing Jews was more important to Hitler than winning the war? Oh, I think quite clearly. Um, I, and I think it's actually, that is actually documented. Um, but uh, there was one particular uh, episode where uh, the Greeks were left alone until 1944, but then the Germans decided to, to round up the Greek Jews. Mm -hmm. And they took two cattle boats, left Athens to tour around the islands to gather them up and they went to Rhodes and got so many and to another island and got even more. And they finally knew that there was one Jew on an island miles away. And they, they went and they got him and they sent him to Auschwitz and he was murdered. And, you know, that was happening at the same time <laughs> they were spending all that effort when they were losing the war when they knew they were, uh, this, this was after, this is actually after the uh, Allied landings in uh, June of 44. So yes, it was, it's a form of total irrationality. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was their obsession, wasn't it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, David. Any other questions? I have a quick one. Sorry, my camera's not working. It's Marnie here. <laughs> oh, um, Marnie, no, hello. Hello. Um, my question is, with the statistics, do we know populations of, you know, because of the Holocaust, six million Jews perished, but with the statistics of suicide, rate, suicide rates, how high or low or the statistics of that, do we, do we have anything like that? Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understood that. How, do we know how many, how yes. many Jews? So if the statistics, if we included the suicide rates, because I'm assuming the, as far as I know, the 6 million and the 11 million altogether were just populations of people who were in camps and who had died because of the camps. And so I'm wondering, do we know the statistics compared to 
the camps and compared to suicide rates? Um, possibly, but I'm afraid I don't know them. I'm sorry, I, sorry I can't help you with that, but I'll make a note of it and look it up. And it's seriously, if you would like the question answered, I can, um, we can exchange email addresses or whatever. Um, yeah. If, if you, if you want. Through, I'm through. happy to facilitate that. It's a really interesting question, Money. In other words, how much more than 6 million actually was the toll? Exactly. And I was, I, and honestly, this is why I was so intrigued about this lecture was because I'd never actually thought about it from this side. And I would also see that it would be quite difficult to comprehend because there are letters, there's notes. So who is the ones that are committing suicide due to trying to avoid deportation or trying to take controls back into their own versus the ones that just were having sure. just a hard time? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, yes, that, that is a very, that's a very good point. And of course, uh, I didn't feel that there was ample time to address it, but um, uh, suicide generally in the general German population was very high after World War I uh, with the um, economic problems, the tremendous economic problems they went through. They felt very uh, depressed. They were out of work. They were there was hunger. You know, it was, it was this, the serious social problems that came along with uh, the end of the war, uh, which of course they blame mostly on the Jews. But <laughs> um, yes, that led to a great increase in in um, ma mainly amongst the working classes uh, in German ordinary German suicide. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really learned a lot and I appreciate it. And yes, Deborah, if you could definitely pass on the information, I would love to know the statistics on it. No worries at all. I think we've got space for maybe one, two more. Is there anyone else wanting to ask a question of Catherine? Oh, yes, Rachel, you need to unmute yourself. Um, I, I don't have a question. If just to say thank you, Catherine, um, as well for the both for a fascinating um, and devastating lecture, but also for, I think that it's very important in the presentation of, that, of this information to give it um, uh, a dignity. Um, and I, I think you did that and thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Anyone else? In that case, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, thank you, Rosari. Did you see that, Catherine? Okay. So, yes.